Well, I want to welcome you today. My name is Dick Staub, uh, and it is my honor to uh, welcome you to what promises to be a very important day. Uh, I've known Reverend Earl Palmer since uh, he was pastor at Berkeley Presbyterian. He was probably the first pastor that really introduced me to the idea that you could be warm-hearted and also have a keen mind and pull it all together in your preaching ministry. And, and it's when I got uh, a vision of what expositional preaching was and, and can be and should be for the church today. Uh, I know how important this day is to uh, Reverend Palmer and to Shirley and to the team that put this event together because we're all aware that the American church is undergoing a radical transformation. And at the heart of the matter is really the role of words, uh, the written word of God and its communication. Uh, one person commenting on this subject says that when it comes to preaching, it could be said, as in Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. And we look at the landscape around us and recognize that preaching and teaching and how to handle scripture is an issue that has become increasingly important, and particularly as we think about intergenerational issues. Uh, for today, we're not going to just be dealing with the tools of exposition, but we're actually going to be talking about the case for expositional preaching. Uh, to illustrate the importance of that, let me quote one of the leaders of the postmodern church who said recently, if the church is to be relevant to millennials, today's teens and young adults, I don't think we'll have orators much longer. Art, dance, and music are the new forces that will play increasingly larger roles. Now, if you're seeing a special beaming look on my angelic face this morning, it's because our son is the director of visual effects at Disney Animation, and his animated short won the Academy Award last night, uh, Feast. And I, I mention that only to say that while we're proud of his accomplishments, and if you've seen Feast, you know that there are no words in Feast. It's entirely visual. And yet, Josh represents this younger generation, and what I'm most proud of him is the fact that he loves scripture, he leads a home fellowship where they go verse by verse through scripture, he uh, has had many artists tell him that he, uh, they were inspired by J.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, even though they aren't Christian, and they've reached these places in this generation where they're playing key roles in the media entertainment world, and they still understand the importance of ideas and words. And so I have to say personally, I take this subject very, very seriously. We're so fortunate to have as our guide today, Reverend Earl Palmer, uh, who really needs no introduction. Uh, every one of us here have some special encounter or understanding of who this man is and how he has shaped so many lives, including, speaking for myself, my own. Uh, and today, we're not going to do a lot of introductions. Uh, as you've got the program in front of you, each person will come up and do their part of the program. I do want to mention that there will be questions and answers throughout today. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, jot it down very carefully, try to make it succinct, and during the question and answer times, we'll give you an opportunity to, uh, to ask your questions. We're going to get started this morning with another man that I have a lot of respect for, uh, Dr. Stephen Newby. As we come to you to receive the food of your holy word, take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today. In our acts of love and our deeds of faith Speak, O Lord, and renew in us All your purposes for your glory Teach us, 
Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, to your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I stand. Was blind, but now I see. O gracious eternal God, we who you have called to handle your word, Lord, continue to teach us and to speak to us today in a great way. Fill us with your spirit. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace. In Christ's holy name, may God's people say, Amen. Please join me in prayer. We thank you, Eternal One, for this glorious day. We thank you for your presence with us this morning as always. And as you so often encourage us through scripture, this morning we pray that you will give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to embrace all that you have for us. Amen. Steve, thank you for that wonderful song. What a way to begin. And uh, welcome to every one of you who are here. I feel so honored that so many of you are here. And, and what a uh, wonderful, uh, what a wonderful balance of men and women and uh, young and old. I just think it's just exciting. And imagine you've come to hear the case for exposition. Some people wonder, what in the world does that word even mean? Exposition of scripture, the, the explaining of the text. So the text makes its own point. Well, uh, from me today, you'll, he there, you'll have a chance to hear three Bible studies. And the first one uh, we'll start with right now. I have a text for you today. The text is 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 1. It's the first verse of the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians. This is one of Paul's very first books. In fact, um, almost all interpreters believe the first book written in the New Testament is 1 Thessalonians by St. Paul. And that would make probably the second book written in the New Testament may well be 2 Thessalonians. And in it, he has just said this before this sentence that we hear. He has said, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal companionship. The word in, in the RSV is, is comfort. It's the word parakletos. He has come alongside of us. And he has given us hope. He comes alongside our hearts and he strengthens us in every good work and word. And then after that wonderful statement about the love of Jesus Christ and his companionship with us, he then has this prayer request he gives to the Thessalonians. And here it is. We'll look at that together. He says, uh, in fact, the, the text is in front of you. I've got four inter re renderings of this text. Uh, four translations. It gives you one of the clues I'm going to give you on exposition. When you're doing exposition, one of the first things you can do is to take 
get three or four translations of the Bible in front of you. See how the translators have worked with the words, have worked with the language, how they try to express what the text is saying. And even if you don't know Greek or Hebrew, if you're reading an Old or New Testament text, just looking at the translations will help to alert you to key words that are in the text, key ideas that are there. And sometimes they're words that the translators are struggling to try to explain. I just did that with the word parakletos, which was in chapter three. It's the word to come alongside. It's the word our Lord uses for the Holy Spirit. I will send the paraclete, the one who comes alongside. Though here the revised standard said comfort, uses the word comfort. If you looked at another text, they might say companionship or the coming alongside of your life. So seeing translations will give you a clue as to uh, sometimes what uh, Lewis has a great line in his book, Experiment and Criticism. Tell me what the hard words mean. And you've done more for me than a thousand commentaries. What do the words mean? What did they mean when they were first used? And so here, St. Paul, it writes to the Thessalonians and he uses some language. And I give you four renderings of verse one of chapter three, Second Thessalonians, just to alert you to that. Finally, brothers and sisters, here's the new RSV. Uh, finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us so that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified everywhere just as it is among you. Even when I read the RSV, I realized there are two key thoughts there that you've got to be explained. You've got to understand what Paul's getting at. One is, what does he mean by spread rapidly? And what does he mean by be glorified? We know the word glory, doxa. We get the word doxology from that word. The word glory as a noun is used a lot in the Bible. The glory of the Lord. Okay, but what about when it's a verb? be glorified or to glorify. And we know that is a key word. What does it mean? Well, we know that in classical Greek, to be glorified is used to refer to, the, to, to recognize the high dignity or the high worth of something or the high worth of a person in this case. That would be to glorify something. To glorify the Lord would be to recognize his, his great uh, reality and his great truth. And so that's the way the word would be used. So here I, I was alerted immediately just reading the RSV text that we've got some key thoughts being brought here. But I, I want to understand what spread rapidly means and I want to understand what glorified means. So notice, then I took James Moffat's translation. It's called the New Translation by James Moffat. He did it in 1926, but that's what they called it, the New Translation. Here's how he translated it. Finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us. All right, that's the same. That the word of the Lord may speed on in triumph and triumph as it in your own case. Notice, now he's translating to be glorified with triumph and speed on. Now, he's very shrewd to give that translation because actually in the Greek, the word is trexo. And it's used rarely in the New Testament. That's the word Paul uses here that the RSV decided to translate spread rapidly. But it's the word trexo. T-R-E-X-O would be in English, I guess. But that Greek word is only used rarely in the New Testament. I'll give you two places where it's used. It's used in Matthew 28 when the two women came to the tomb and Jesus was not there and the angel said, he's not here. Go and tell the disciples. And the text says they ran to the disciples. That's the word trexo. It means to run. It means to run. And it's used also in Hebrews 12, 1, a text we all love. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that's set before us. Christ himself has gone on ahead of us. Run, that's the word. Moffat saw it. That's better than spread rapidly. Speed, it speeds on and triumphs. It, it, its great worth was won over to us. And he says, as it did among you, you saw 
the greatness of this word, this living word, Jesus Christ. You saw that in the text that led just to this, the word is referred to Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord. Notice here, it's called the word of the Lord. Just that passage that was finished that, tell about, that tells about Christ coming alongside of us, Christ giving us hope and his love, which was used decisively in the sentence just before this prayer. And now he says, now brothers, finally brothers and sisters, Pray for us that the word of the Lord, this word we just looked at about Christ's love and his person, may speed on rapidly and triumph as in your own case. All right? Then Eugene Peterson, he caught it perfectly. Listen to Gene Peterson in his message. One more thing, friends. Pray for us. Notice they're all the same there. So that we haven't learned a great deal different from James uh, from the uh, uh, Eugene Peterson translation from the others. But notice how he does. Uh, by the way, uh, the message is not a strict translation in the tradition of translations. It's a free translation. In the strict tradition, you're supposed to use one word for one word. If a word in the Greek is used, you're supposed to try to find one word in English that will go for that word, which is what you get in authorized translations. But this is a free translation, so Eugene Peterson decided he could use a whole lot of words to, instead of just one word. And sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses, because sometimes you get a little bit murky in some of the things that Gene Peterson is. And I think especially, in my opinion, Gene is far better in handling Paul than he is in handling the words of our Lord. Because when he starts to add a lot of words to what our Lord said, Jesus doesn't need a lot of words added, usually, because his... His words are so economical. So it, I'm not sure the message is as effective in the Gospels as it is in St. Paul. But here, Jean, uh, Eugene Peterson, one of my great friends and one of the great uh, free, free uh, translation uh, writers uh, that we have of the Bible. Here it is as a translator. One more thing, friends. Pray for us. Pray that the master's word will simply take off and race through the country. He saw that trexo was the word used there. Gene Peterson knows uh, Greek very, very well. And he saw that trexo means run. You've got to get somehow the idea of run in it. And uh, simply take off and run through the country to a groundswell. And that's a wonderful translation of to glorify. Glorify means that you see a groundswell and you realize how important this is, how great this is, how true it is, so that it makes sense to you, see, as it did among you. Notice, just as it did among you, it made sense to you. And I think that's what Paul is saying. He's praying that. He says, pray for me, that the word of God may speed on and people will see that it makes sense and they'll believe it because it will triumph. See, it'll be glorified. And now the King James, you know, I come back to the King James usually when it comes to the beautiful use of the English language. The King James Bible didn't have as many manuscripts to work with as the RSV did because a couple of the great manuscripts hadn't yet been discovered when uh, the King James Bible was put together. But it's a magnificent text. And especially here, it has a wonderful rendering of this text. Listen to it. Finally, brethren, brothers and sisters, Pray for us. Notice they're all the same there. That the word of the Lord, the same, may have free course. Wow. What a way to talk about a word, a word that can run. Nobody is going to stop it. Nobody is going to hem it in. Turn it loose. By the way, that's what exposition is all about. I hope we can learn how to do that, how to turn the text loose so that it gets to make its mark and gets to have free course. Isn't that beautiful? That it may have free course, and then he, the, R, the King James said, and be glorified. That's the word. They don't try to work with glorified like Eugene Peterson did, uh, but, or like uh, Moffat did when he said triumph. But, and be glorified, even as it is with you. There's our text. There's the text for the case for exposition. Notice uh, that what we have there is some key words that were alerted to us in the text. And when you're doing Bible study, you want to look for those key words. You want to look for 
the key themes that are there in the text. What is Paul getting at? What is, what's on his heart? What is the thing that he's trying, the point he's trying to make? Now, sometimes you can win and sometimes you can maybe uh, blur it. So be careful. That's why you always need a check and balance. You need the Greek text to back you up. You need to look at other translators to see if they agree with what you did. You need to, uh, you need to test it in a small Bible study group with other people to see how they handle it too. And that's where the brothers and sisters help us to do good Bible study rather than just do it as a lone, as a lone, uh, a lonely thing you do by yourself. Though that's valuable too. But notice here you have this first thing that the text did. It alerted us to two key ideas. What does he mean by spread rapidly? Frankly, I don't like that RSV translation, spread rapidly. I don't know. It's, it's good, I guess, but it, I like the King James. Have free course. Better. Have free course. Let the word spread. Let it speed. Let it make its mark. And then you'll see the truth. And the truth will... That truth of the glorified. So obviously this text stirs you up to want to understand what glorified in the verbal sense means. What does it mean to something being glorified? And that will then get you going on looking at other places where St. Paul uses a word. I have found it very helpful, and you don't need to know Greek to do this. If you see a word that's used, see other places. You can take, a lex- you can take a, a, just a simple lexicon or a simple uh, uh, guide to the Bible and see other places where Paul uses the word glorified now as a, as a verb. Here's an example. He does it in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, he does a play on the word glorify. And that play in the word helps you really to understand how exciting the word is when it appears in 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Corinthians, uh, the third chapter, he talks about the word glory. Listen to it. For if there was glory in the ministry of judgment... In other words, when judgment happens, we see the glory of God, the truth of God. It's up there when God judges us. Okay, so Paul says, if there was glory in the ministry of judgment, much more does the ministry of justification abound in glory. See, it's a play on words now. There's glory when God God judges Uh, like the Supreme Court is one of the most glorious buildings in Washington, D.C. It may be the most glorious building, except for the Capitol itself, is the Supreme Court building, where judgment is happening. And a judgment is happening. It's a glorious moment when judgment comes down, Paul says, all right? Especially, you know, if you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. All right, when the Lord does his own vengeance, when he does it, that, that is glory. When we try to do it, it's terrorism. When we try to do it, it's evil, pure evil, often. Pascal is the one who said, men never delight in doing evil as much as if they can do it for religious reasons. And there's nothing worse than when we try to exercise vengeance. Uh, 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 That's not glorious. And that's not what Paul says here. He says, if there is glory in the ministry of judgment, much more now does the ministry of justification abound in glory. Second use of the word glory, doxa. Indeed, what once had glory, third use of the word, which would be judgment, what once had glory has lost its glory because of a greater glory. Now he puts the word hyper, hyper glory, a hyper glory, a greater glory. What could be a greater glory than the Supreme Court? What could be a greater glory than judgment against sin when sin should be judged? Okay, for if what was Well, because of a greater glory. For if what was set aside came through glory, much more has the permanent come in glory. And what's the permanent? The grace of God. The grace of God is the thing that lasts the longest. It lasts the longest. That's what Paul is saying there in 2 Corinthians. The grace of God lasts the longest. It's the most glorious thing when that grace dawns on you. And so notice, that's exactly what Paul's saying in 2 Thessalonians. He's talking about grace in the third chapter, and now he comes to a prayer in the second chapter, and now he says, pray for me, folks. And now I'll read it again. Pray for me 
brothers and sisters, that the word of the Lord may speed on and triumph and make its case and win people to see how wonderful God's uh, grace is, his lordship is, as it has in your own case. One more thing, friends. Pray for us. Pray that the master's word will simply take off and race through the country to a groundswell of response, just as it did among you. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. Don't you love that? It may have its chance and win its case, even as it did among you. All right, I want to talk about that today, and we do it in, the, in, th- in three different Bible studies. Here's the first one we just had. I'm sold on this allowing a text, that when the text makes its own point and we see it for ourselves. I'm sold on this for personal reasons as well as for theological reasons here. It's a big part of how I myself became a Christian, how I followed Jesus Christ. I came to Cal Berkeley as just a sophomore, as a freshman, and uh, I was really just a secular kid. I was raised in a wonderful family. My mother was Episcopalian. We went to church and stuff like that. Went to the community church. But somehow it didn't really stick with me. And I came to Cal. I didn't even go to church for the first couple of years. I was so busy uh, in hiking. I was, hiking was my life. I climbed Shasta so many times, and that's the whole thing I was living for. And it's a, it's a small thing to live for. But I, I loved it. And I was doing that with the hiking club and the Sierra Club and doing all that in the weekend, so there was no time for that. But a friend of mine invited me to a Bible study. In my sophomore year, I went to that Bible study. It was in my dorm. It was an all-male dorm called Barrington Hall. And a bunch of guys just read the text of the New Testament together. And they would just do it for an hour. And I didn't even have a Bible when I went to the first meeting of the group when I was invited by Arba Hudgens to come to it. And I had to go out and buy a Bible for that class. And I did. I went out and bought a Bible. It shows you a little about my personality. I went to Sather Gate Bookstore, and they said for $1 more, I could have my name put on the Bible. And so I had my name put on that Bible. I still have that. It was the King James Bible. And it was wonderful, though, except that when I showed up to the group the next week, they said, oh, that's a wonderful Bible. We're using the RSV here. Uh, so then I had to go buy another Bible in order to be up with the group that was studying. But what happened was, in looking to that text and then getting involved with the, the university group there at the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, where I later became senior pastor, what happened was the text won me over. And here's how they did. They pointed me to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ won my respect. And then respect is a few inches away from faith. It's not faith, but it is the beginning. And then when I began to see the promises that Jesus Christ was making and realized that I could put my weight on them. Uh, Dr. Munger put it this way at a conference. It was a turning point for me. He said, when on the basis of what you know about Jesus Christ, you're willing to trust in his trustworthiness, then you're ready to become a Christian. And I realized that summer I was ready to become a Christian by putting my weight down on the trustworthiness of Christ that I saw in the Bible. It was the Jesus Christ of the Bible who won me, not the Jesus Christ of myth or that somebody makes as a great Christ myth that somebody comes up with. Uh, it, It was not the faith of my friends. It was the Jesus I met in the text, in the Bible, and he won me. And uh, he won my respect, and he won my faith. And it's interesting, Calvin says the authority of the Bible comes the same way. He says the authority of the Bible gets its authority from its living center. The Bible gets its authority from its center, outward, from Jesus Christ. It surrounds Christ. The Old Testament by anticipation and the New Testament in witness surrounds Jesus Christ. He wins your respect, and he won my respect. And I became a believer. And then uh, when I went, I decided finally, uh, this Bible study group became very important to me. And one day I went to Dr. Morgan and said, I think I'd like to be a pastor. I didn't know anything about being a pastor uh, because I liked our youth pastor there at the church. And I said, I'd like to be like him so I could work with college kids because I'm loving this as a, as a college student now. And so I, did, I applied, went to Princeton Seminary, and then I got involved in a Bible study there. First with a bunch of guys in the seminary, and then it just happened that I got into a Bible study with some young men. Princeton then was an all-male 
college. I got in with some young men at the college and did a Bible study with them. And I ended up with about five of those Bible studies. I only started one. And the others, the guys asked me, would you help us with our Bible study group? And I watched young men for the next two, three years, my three years at Princeton Seminary. I saw young guys reading the text. I never tried to make anybody a Christian. I just said, look at the text. I figured some weeks Paul wins, some weeks he loses. I mean, he doesn't always win you. Sometimes he makes you mad. But Jesus always wins you. He wins your respect. Sometimes he upsets us too. But then he always comes around and fulfills even the upset so that we decide that he, I respect him and then trust him. And I saw guys become Christians. And then I went into the ministry, and I'll tell you, it has become a fundamental part of my ministry. If I could get somebody to look at the text, I sought it with these young college kids. I saw it in my own life. If I could get somebody to look at the text, sooner or later, not always sooner, but sooner or later, the text would always bring them to its living center, and that's Jesus Christ. Exotic Curious, weird religious stuff happens when people don't let the text bring them to its center. But when the text brings you to the center of Jesus Christ, you don't end up with weird stuff. You end up with healthy faith because he's healthy. You end up with his grace and his truth, his judgment, his grace. And the grace, thank God, is the longest lasting. It's what lasts the longest. I'm so glad. So you make that discovery. And so therefore, when I got into the ministry, it had a big effect on my philosophy of evangelism. I started my career here at University Presbyterian Church, Seattle, as a student pastor. And really, I think I built, here is Ed Schnebley sitting right here, was in that original group. I built my college ministry around, we had a public meeting for sure on Tuesday night, but the small Bible study groups, I think, were the soul of the way people really became Christians. They met other guys and women, men and women, and they got into a Bible study and they saw the text for themselves and it made sense to them. So I built my evangelism around it. I believe that the finest evangelism happens when people have a chance to see the text for itself and meet the Lord of the text, Jesus Christ. So uh, I also found that the best discipleship happens. Uh, discipleship happens in seeing the text. I know sometimes when I'm a pastor and I get certain concerns on my heart, I'll say, I must preach now about these concerns. I must give now a stewardship sermon. You know, I don't like that. Uh, then that means that I'll pick a text that's going to help people be generous with their money. And then I may take, pick a text, but you spring out of the text and then everybody forgets the text because I've got now anecdotes and stories about how generous people get the blessing of God and stuff like that. And it's all built on my anecdotes and built on themes that I'm creating. But in effect then, the people didn't see it for themselves in the text. They, they saw my advocacy for something. And the danger with that is that after a while, people have faith because you have faith. Uh, they don't have faith because they saw it for themselves. Or they, they're good stewards because the pastor said, we've got a stewardship campaign and we've got to raise so much money now. Okay, now come through, be generous. God will bless you then if you do it. But where is that in the text? Let the text teach. By the way, the texts in the Bible have more to say about money than almost any other uh, ancillary theme. But let them say it the way the text says it. Then a person can see it for themselves. That moment the great moment in preaching is when a text is unfolding and the people in the room see the point before you say it. Like today, it was fun to see you uh, spark to run when you saw it in the text. It means run. And thousands of things went through your brain when you thought that. Isn't that right? Before you heard Jim, uh, Eugene Peterson tell you that, uh, that it took off. But you saw it in the text. And the text then got very exciting. And I saw that for discipleship too. Discipleship uh, is not you should have faith because I have faith. You should have hope because I have hope. You should have faith because you discovered it and the trustworthiness of Jesus Christ, that's why you should have faith. So that becomes the solid ground. Uh, now the question is how do you prepare to do exposition? How do you prepare to do this kind of? I hope today's gonna be a help because the next hour I'm gonna use the gospel text. 
and, and then make some comments on how to use a gospel text and to be faithful to it so that it can make its own point and you can see it. And then finally, we'll look at St. Paul again uh, from the book of Philippians in the afternoon. But how do I prepare for exposition? I'm going to give you now just five steps to get you ready for exposition. One, begin with curiosity. Curiosity is the way to begin. I think it's the way to begin Bible study. It's the way to begin getting ready for anything. Curiosity. Uh, Take a journey yourself with your questions. Start with questions. What are you curious to know? Like when you read that text, what struck you as something? What does it mean by spread rapidly? I don't know. When I read the RSV, I said, what in the world does that mean? Now, I do know Greek, so I went immediately and looked at the Greek text and saw that it was trexo. And I realized then that trexo is only used three times in the New Testament. Okay, that's been fun. It means run. Okay. And I got on my way with a curious question. Raise the question. So uh, Bible study will begin with curiosity. And I'm going to suggest a five-step approach to getting ready for exposition. And the first is, first you start with establishing the text. That's what we did when we tried to see the words, tell me what the hard words mean, is establishing the text. And sometimes that becomes more complicated than other times. What is the best text? And your, all your translations will definitely help you with that. You're going to establish the text first. Start with it. Then two, uh, you want to then ask the historical question. What is happening inside the text and behind the text? Well, the historical question would be uh, something about maybe the Thessalonians. And this is where you're getting into a little more uh, questions about When you see something like in a gospel account, you read a word where Jesus is having an argument with the Pharisees. The historical question then gets you to do something in Bible study that takes some research on your part. You've got to get a dictionary of the Bible and look up Pharisee. (laughs) And that will help you a lot. It will save you from making foolish statements that some pastors even make. I've heard pastors who talk about the Pharisees and, and refer to them as clergymen who are super righteous. But that's one thing they weren't. They were laymen. So if you're going to blast anybody for the Pharisee movement, they're lay people who were too proud. The clergy were the Sadducees. Okay, but get it right. Don't make somebody angry with you for the wrong reasons because you didn't get it right. So you do the historical question. If, if a word like Pharisee appears, if something appears in the text that stirs you up, where is it? Uh, where is Caesarea Philippi? Well, look it up. You can do that with a dictionary of the Bible. That's the simplest thing you can do. And find out the historical question. And then sometimes the historical question behind the text. For example, in the book of John, John starts his gospel by saying three times in the prologue that John the Baptist is not the Christ. Why would he repeat it three times that he's not the Christ? Is there a problem there? Is there something that I need to know? Did some people get confused and think that John the Baptist was Messiah? All right, that gets me going at a deeper level with the historical question. I want to know something about that. That's called form criticism. I'm trying to get behind the text to find out why John is repeating three times that John the Baptist is not the Christ. Did some people think he was? If you read closely the gospel accounts, you realize they did. Remember in, when Apollos came to, to Ephesus and Priscilla and Ocula met him and said he had, was worshiping John the Baptist and didn't know about Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of John the Baptist. So it's true. John the Baptist was a very famous person. So that helps you to understand all those texts that had to do with John the Baptist. That's a historical question. Then the third step is what I call the words, what do they say, and what do they mean? Now, this is the theological question, where I'm now taking a text and looking at the words in the text. First of all, what do the words say? Then I'm going to try to make a move from what they say to what I think they mean. What is Jesus getting at when he makes this reference? 
Uh, be careful I don't, I don't misunderstand him. But what is he getting at? And here's where I start doing work, where I write. And you know, writing is a terrific thing to do. Writing and talking and meeting with people, a small Bible study group where you can take a, a sentence of Jesus and try to figure out what's he getting at. We'll do that this, in, this, in the next hour when we look at John 15. What's he getting at? What's he say? What does he mean? Try to understand the truth. And then the fourth, the fourth question is how would people that heard him in the first century, how would they react to what's happening here or what's being said? Very often the text itself will give you the clue to that. What's happening when you get a, uh, when you, I, I like what one person said about the Gospel of John. One of the great things about the Gospel of John is that John, more than any other gospel writer, shows you how much of a strain Jesus was on people because he reports all the arguments against Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not. They, they really don't. They tell you what Jesus did, but they don't give you an insight into what bothered the people. We owe a great debt to John because there's 34 times in John's gospel where he shows arguments that the people have against Jesus. So we owe that to John. We owe it to see what were the things, if Jesus said something and he bothered them, what was it that bothered them? How did his generation understand? And then you can go 21 centuries and say, and what bothers our century about some of the things that he's saying right now? And what bothers me? That would be the great, what I would call the contemporary question. And then finally, the fifth and the most important, according to Schnockenberg, great theologian, no commentary is a valid commentary if it doesn't raise the discipleship question. What does this text say to me? What does it say to me? Don't ever be a preacher who talks about the they out there, what they need to know. What do I need to know? What is this text saying to me? How is it getting a grip on my life? And that's what I call the discipleship question. Well, there's, there's a way to start. And... It's a way to prepare for exposition. And there's a great moment, it seems to me a great moment in teaching, is when a text is unfolding, maybe uh, I hope can happen in the next hour or so, when we look at a text from John 15. A text will open, in that case, our Lord is speaking. And as a preacher or a teacher, it's just a great moment when you're looking out over an audience of men and women of all ages and there you see a light and you realize that aha aha it becomes an aha moment i see it and i want to tell you something when you see a point yourself before a pastor tells you the point when you see what love is before a pastor who tells you this is what love is be careful be careful what you say something is. Let a person discover it, if they can, from the text. And I'll tell you something. When you discover a great truth like love, glory, uh, and even some of the negative themes, when you see what sin really means in the Bible's account, and, or when you see what justification really means, what sanctification means, what reconciliation really means, when you see it for yourself, you will remember it. It's yours. It's, you know, it kind of worries me about uh, today. One of the biggest problems in uh, students writing term papers now is that they can go to Google and they can go to various uh, apps and they can get citations from Martin Luther or citations from Carl, even my beloved Karl Barth or C.S. Lewis or other citations. Read them in, in an app. Put them into their term paper. And then they get a good grade at... Uh, unless they didn't do approbation. If they didn't uh, give a uh, citation, then the professor's going to get them. If, 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 and that can happen to you, too. And they, uh, this is what I said. Oh, no, no. That was said earlier by uh, Martin Luther. Oh, oh, I see. I didn't know. Uh, <laughs> so without, then you lose your PhD. They take your PhD away from you if that happens. And that's happened to several people. Okay. But... I'm still worried about the fact that what you can do today because of technology and because of the computer and because of apps, you can get citations and put them in your term paper. But the problem is the citation went from Martin Luther to your computer to your paper. It did not go through your brain. And the proof of that will come when a professor sits you down and says, hey, I noticed you quoted Karl Barth there on that uh, from his uh, 
from his dogmatics and outline, I noticed that. Tell me, what was it that really struck you by that? Oh, well, no, I saw it in, in an app. You would never dare say that because then the professor would say C instead of A. Uh, but it's a sad moment when a person asks you a question and you realize, I saw something that was said, the pastor said it, and I put it over here and I, I put it into my so-called belief system, but it didn't go through my head. It didn't go through my heart. I did not discover it. And folks, if there is one great value to exposition, for you as an expositor, first of all, a teacher, but it means you don't go to a class, even a small Bible study group in your group, having not thought about it. But it, the great advantage to exposition is that the text gets to go through your brain, gets to go through your heart. You get to weigh in on it. You get to figure out what you think it means first. See what it means. Tie it out on others. There's the fellowship of uh, believers that help you. And then it's yours. And it has its lasting effect. Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, text in Thessalonians. That it was so good to realize. To realize that. Your truth and your love can speed on and it can win a hearing and it can even triumph in our lives. Lord, we're grateful for that. And we're, great, we're grateful that Paul prayed that and that he believed it. And that's why he probably did so much exposition of great texts. So Lord, now bless us and and the rest of this day, too, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now I think I have uh, some responders. Earl Palmer. Wow. I've <laughs> been following you a long time um, from the Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area. Uh, attended a predominantly African-American church, the Baptist tradition. And my first question to you Growing up in Richmond, California, where your wife, Shirley, was a teacher in the Contra Costa School District, I knew this was going to come around one day. Uh, Earl, when I first heard the term biblical expo exposition, I took that to mean an approach to the study of the Bible that required college or seminary training. Further explain why that is not necessarily the case, because when you hear that term from uh, for the first time, um, it's, it could be a little foreboding. Explain why that's not necessarily the case where you have to go to school and spend half of your life studying the, uh, the Bible in order to teach the Bible. Wow. Well, hey, thanks, Rick. I love that question because uh, that's why I started this journey with the word curiosity. I think that's the key. Mm -hmm. It's the curi uh, a, a curiosity of a... Of a uh, 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 in this case, a Christian that wants to teach the Bible, mm -hmm. well, you're curious and you, and you have questions. Yeah. And you build questions in. And then, uh, that's why, you know, today, I wanted to use four English translations of one Greek text mm -hmm. rather than to say, okay, now in the Greek it says this, in the Greek it says that. I wanted you to see that you don't, you can just use the English translations mm -hmm. and, and, and now there are so many of them. And you could just array them and use them and they will get you going in a very valid way because the translators are struggling to see what the words mean because we do want to know what the words mean mm -hmm. and what they meant then and what they mean now to me. And, uh, but of course, to do what they mean now, you're as good an authority by living now as, as anybody that writes 20 or 30 years ago. So you're an authority on that. Uh, for your and for me, I, I, I'm an authority on what, what they mean now, at least to the people I know. Mm -hmm. But the, what they meant then, I may need the help of the translators. Mm -hmm. So, hey, you're right. I don't think you need to have the... That's freeing because um, for many pastors like myself, uh, we're aware of the term Saturday night special, which means <laughs> we're trying to get that sermon together before Sunday... Uh, this process here seems like it would take a little more time. <laughs> Explain that, letting the text speak for itself and going through the five-point process for a pastor 
in order to be relative and yet honest to the text? Well, I'm, you know, I, I did not coach him on that question either, but it, it does take time. And I'll give you one guideline from my own experience, and I, I'll share it. For, now, this may not be yours, but it was for me. Uh, early on in the ministry, I decided to move the dates earlier rather than later on the emergency moment, which is when you actually have to stand up and speak. Whether I had to stand up and speak before my college group on Tuesday night, or a young, if you're a young life leader, you have a club meeting on Wednesday night, or I had to stand up and speak on Sunday morning in church. So I made it a policy, and I did follow this, I followed it all my life, uh, that I would move the date earlier in the week than Saturday, and make Saturday my day off. I made Saturday my day off, and I never even thought about the church and things like that, hopefully, on Saturday. And, but that meant that Thursday was my emergency day, was the day I had to have my sermon. I preach from one expanded outline, uh, both sides of a yellow pad, and I've always done my preaching from an expanded outline, both sides of one page. Now, I'm not against a full manuscript. That's fine, too. But I had this part, my both sides of a yellow pad, uh, was, and then quotations would always be uh, noted with a special quotation tradition that I developed. I'd always, when I quoted somebody, I would always have the book present in the room if I'm going to quote somebody rather than have it on a card or quote from my brain. I quoted Pascal from my brain because I know that quote. But I would have my sermon done by Thursday noon. And I made that my rule. And I never, I can honestly say I rarely ever miss that. Thursday noon, I knew what I was going to say on Sunday. Now, the value of that was that then on Thursday afternoon, I worked on the next week. And I found that if I worked well on the next week, on Thursday afternoon, then that protects you from throwing everything into the sermon every week. You don't have to, then, that, then you don't steal the thunder from next week if you know you're going through a text. Okay, so I would work on next week, and I can honestly tell you that in my years of preaching, uh, uh, not every single week, but if I finish Sunday on the text that I had for this Sunday, I already know so much of what I want to do the next week, I have to be careful not to get it in and ruin this week. But I could go right on and give you next week's sermon too. Wow. Pretty much, it would be raw, but I could do it because I had worked on that on Thursday afternoon. So that was my tradition. Thursday morning, I, and that's the only time I was nervous. By Thursday morning, Thursday noon, it had to be ready. And then Thursday afternoon, I worked on the next week of the next assignment that would be in that cycle. And I found that protected Saturday night. And then what happens is Friday and Saturday, your brain is mulling over all this. And amazing, some of the best illustrations came because it was in my head. I knew what, what the text was. And then during Friday and Saturday often, because I would try to do wider reading on Friday, but on Saturday, maybe you'd go to movies or we'd go do something. And something would come in that would often become a wonderful help and illustration would come because my brain was mulling on it. But I think that is defeated if you have Saturday night emergency like we talked about before. Uh, and I know I've taught preaching classes too that that is a huge problem for the number of pastors who wait till Saturday night to write their sermon. And it's a great mistake in my opinion. That's very freeing and taking this approach, I'll have more date nights with my wife on hey, Saturday. Hey, that's right. Earl, what is the difference, my final question, between letting the Bible make its own point, as you've talked about today, and the preacher-teacher making points and adding scripture to that point. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of made a joke about it earlier. There's a famous professor at Princeton that made this joke, who was a professor of preaching. And uh, he said, he, a student made a sermon and all, and the preacher made this famous line, the, the professor. He said, if the, sermon had, if, the, if the text had had smallpox, the sermon would not have caught it. <laughs> That's what, that, was his, that was his famous line at Princeton. And we all lived under that 
terror that uh, uh, McLeod or somebody would get up and hear my sermon and say, uh, yes, Earl, if the text had had smallpox, it would not have caught it from your sermon. No, that's the danger of using a text as a springboard into your own anecdotes and your own. Then in a way, I don't care what you do, You have really used the text, but you are really saying you should have faith because I have faith. I've got an anecdote now that will show you how brave you can be and how wonderful it could be if you were that way. And now that's what's going to be the thing you take out with it, Uh, not the text. And I think that's a loss. That's why I guess I'm not. I do think thematic preaching is one of the great dangers of the church today where pastors basically build their, their preaching here around themes. Oh, today is love of God theme. This is anti-racism theme. This is a social justice theme. This is Central American justice. I knew a pastor that gave four sermons on Central American justice, but there was hard to find texts that would always go for it. So he ended up with just political anecdotes and it was not a good thing. And, it, and it, it, it was very defeating, I think, for him, too, as well as his people, because he, he had had a trip to Central America, and that was all that was on his mind. Be careful. Get back into the text. It may be that that's a valid thing to come up in a, in a study, but let it come up because it illustrates what a text is saying. And I think that's the key. Thank you, Earl. I just want to finally say uh, what respect I, and I think I speak for many, Leaders, pastors, laity, what respect I have for you and your discipline on the exposition of the word. It encouraged me to study the Greek. And really, I learned the English language studying Greek because I wasn't taught too well in high school. But it was through the Greek uh, that I learned English. And you made studying the Greek and reading the Greek not intimidating, but actually, like you said, fun and curious. So thank you for that. Hey, thank you, Rick. Well, Rick, I think you and I have uh, interpreted the response co- uh, assignment a little bit differently. So I've got a prepared response. Yes, yes. I wonder if I can set my notes down do here. It. And I feel bad having you stand while I talk oh, no, for 10 no, minutes. No, no, but, uh, no. If you get tired, I won't be insulted oh, it, 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 if you sit good. here. But let me, uh, uh, my name is Eric Jacobson, and I uh, have uh, been uh privileged to be under Earl's preaching for many years. I I came to love expositional preaching as a college student under Earl's ministry. Uh, As I became a pastor, Earl walked right alongside of me and taught me um, how to do expositional preaching well and make that a discipline for my life. And it's been a great privilege for me. So I don't don't need to uh, have the case for expositional preaching made for me. I've been persuaded uh, by way of response, I'm certainly not going to argue against expositional preaching, but what I thought would be most helpful uh, maybe for this audience is to think through what I've, uh, some of the challenges that I've faced, some of the changes I've thought through uh, after 20 years of trying to follow in your footsteps in expositional preaching and see what that looks like. Um, and I think for me, the best way to get at that question, you raised it already in your uh, talk today, Earl is to think about the relationship between expositional preaching and discipleship, because I think that's the fundamental thing that uh, we're talking about here. And in particular, I want to think about expositional preaching and discipleship in relation to two fundamental changes that have taken place in the church in my career as a pastor. One change has been the impact of the church growth movement. And the second change has been the impact of the missional church movement. And those both have offered different challenges to uh, expositional preaching and discipleship. The church growth movement has emphasized convenience and practicality. We need to put the hay down where the sheep can get it. And uh, that particular movement has sometimes been critical of expositional preaching, not always, but sometimes, saying that uh, it's an obscure practice. People don't want a 12-week Bible st- or, or sermon series on Romans. People don't want word, word studies. They want uh, a series on how to raise my family. And uh, I think insofar as that represents a critique from the church growth movement, that represents a profound misunderstanding of expositional preaching. I think it may be that there's not enough 
experience of people hearing good expositional preaching to, to come to that conclusion. But Earl, you taught me something very important as a young pastor, and you've just alluded to it. You said you can choose as a young pastor, you've got two, two directions you might go. One is to be a topical preacher, and the other is to be an expositional preacher. And if you choose topical, you will eventually come down to about 20 sermons that you preach over and over and over again for your entire career. And uh, I chose path B, and uh, I found that much more interesting to take a text that's not under your control, but it's the Word of God, and wrestle with it week by week, fundamentally challenge you, you to grow as a pastor. And so I think one of the most important things I learned about expositional preaching is expositional preaching is very good for the discipleship of the pastor before it's good for the discipleship of the congregation. So I think uh, for that reason alone, I've been uh, very grateful for your advice. And I feel like you have set me on a course of adventure as a pastor, where every week I get a text that's not under my control and surprises me as I encounter it week in and week out. So the other uh, movement that I made reference to, the missional church movement, uh, that particular movement has really focused on the church being the form that God's missional uh, heart takes for the world. Uh, very uh, interested in the church being deployed in the community, the, the people of God in the community. There's a little bit of a de-emphasis on the gathered uh, assembly and consequently a de-emphasis on the preached word to some extent. Not a disregard for, but a de-emphasis. They have uh, recast discipleship as apprenticeship. We, uh, we, it's not just sit and get, but it must be go and do. One of the taglines of that movement is, you wouldn't want someone to perform heart surgery on you who've just read a book on heart surgery or heard a good lecture on heart surgery. You want an apprentice. And we need apprentices of Jesus Christ, not just people who have heard a good message. I have to admit I've been somewhat persuaded by that argument, and that's been, uh, that's been a, a change for me over the last couple of years to think through what that means in my life. Now, the, the odd thing, and this is something that maybe is worth talking about, is I feel like one of the unique, maybe not unique, but one of the rare gifts that you bring, Earl, to that conversation is somehow you've managed to be able to preach in a way that they sit and get and your people go and do. I think that's amazing. If you look at your, the fruit of your ministries in Manila, in Berkeley, in Seattle here, you have done a fantastic job of preaching in such a way that it inspires disciples to go and do. I'm not sure that's a universal gift. That's, I'm just gonna put that out there in the sense that, that I don't do that as well as you do. And that's been a, a realization for me that I, uh, can, I think I'm a good expositional preacher I think I, uh, I, I, uh, I, 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 I do a fine job at that, but I haven't felt that the fruit of my expositional preaching has always been discipleship. I have grown increasingly uncomfortable with preaching the word faithfully and sending people out as autonomous individuals to figure out how to apply it in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's been challenging for me. So I have uh, been somewhat, in, as I continue to try to do better, and learn your tricks, and, and not tricks, that's a, a, a very light way of saying it. I, I know there's room for growth, for sure. I've only been 20 years into it, and so I will continue to emphasize expositional preaching, but I have, from the missional church movement, have been learning about things like missional communities and other ways that the, the, the community, the people of God, can be living this out uh, together in community. So I think it's still important. That said, Expositional preaching and teaching continues to be important even within the missional conversation. The missional conversation can go awry if it gets separated from the text. And I think, and this might be an oversimplification, sim but I think the emerging church movement uh, is on a dead end insofar as it strays away from the text. And it's just out there in the community, just being at coffee houses and pubs and being the people of God without real disciplined exposition of the text. So I think that we still need expositional text. And maybe what I'm trying to say here is we need expositional preaching and we need communal discipleship 
in order to live it out. So let me, let me end with a couple of questions. I think, I think what I'm saying is expositional preaching is more important now than it ever has been. We need good exposition of the text. The form of the church, I think, is radically shifting right before us, and we have to figure out what does that mean for expositional preaching. From the church growth movement, one question might be, what does expositional preaching look like, or can it work in a multi-site, simulcast kind of setting? Or is it important that the, the preacher is live in front of the congregation? I think that's coming out of the church growth movement. For the uh, missional church movement, the question is, can expositional preaching be done by someone in a house church movement uh, without seminary training? Can it, can it be decentralized and still retain the integrity of respect for the text? So those are my closing questions and my thoughts on expositional preaching. Thank you. Wow. Wonderful. Man, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, everything. And... Uh, uh, oh, no, oh no, I've got my mic. They, they've got me wired. So I'm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, I like uh, with, with the these two movements that have been so uh, prominent in, in the in the formation of what is now the reality of the church, the uh, seeker friendly uh, movement to make the church as friendly as possible. Man, I applaud that. I think that is so important. Uh, and then, of course, the missional presence movement, the faithful presence movement of being the church of Jesus Christ. And it's sort of a little bit of what uh, it, it, we have a lot of young life leaders here today. It seems to me that's one, that missional presence has been the, the great gift that Jim Rayburn gave uh, in the young life movement, that uh, don't just have a church perched somewhere and trying to reach high school kids. There needs to be a sense of missional presence of knowing who kids are, being alongside of them. And so both these things are, and I just think your warning is a good warning, but it's also, it's a promise. If we keep the text, if we keep uh, Bible study in our lives, and I like what you said, that maybe the best for a young pastor or a young life leader or someone trying to be uh, uh, involved in the in presence Remember that you, if you're going to be present, you've got to have a resource that's worth sharing when somebody does ask you, hey, what do you think? And, you've, and that having something that's worth sharing is going to come from your own uh, expositional study where you're, exposit just means to, to see what the text is saying in its own terms and, and within the larger framework of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what does it mean? And what does it mean for me? And I think asking those five questions are always going to be anchors. Now, the thing you raise, though, that I think is really important now, how do we lure or trick, use the word tricks, how do we trick people into uh, exposing themselves to this where they think maybe it's boring or they don't want to do it? Well, I, I think... I, in fact, I use the phrase that I built my, uh, my philosophy was a little bit around this, that if I could, I didn't, you didn't use the word trick, if I could trick, if I could get someone to look at the text, if I could get them to do it, sooner or later, I have so much confidence in the inner power of the text, like Eugene Peterson is saying, it takes off. I have so much confidence in that, that if I could get them to look at it, Sooner or later, it would always point them to the living center. And it's the living center who has the authority. I don't want to make them fascinated with biblical curiosities. And by the way, that's what worried me about the prophetic movement in Protestantism. It became so fascinated with what I would call obscure curiosities of timetables and of things like this of who is Gog and Magog, which the book of Revelation, I wrote a commentary on Revelation, so I take the lean rather than luxurious interpretive model for Revelation. And it makes Revelation a threatening book instead of a joyous book that is comforting us in the midst of, of stress. But when we do such analysis of the stress and even develop charts and timetables, in a way we have now, uh, we, we don't have a resource that's there, that is the way Paul describes it, a, a grace that's a greater grace than judgment. It, we begin fascinated maybe with judgment then or fascinated with timetables. So how do you 
how do you outwit this? Get people in the text with some other friends. They, the, they will then become a kind of a check and balance on you. And they will help keep you on center. And very often by the way they respond to what the text says, you realize that there are lots of ways to respond to this text. But it, if you can somehow get people to do it, uh, and that maybe requires a, it requires a shrewd approach. Uh, let me t- give you one example from Manila. I went to Manila having been a pastor of students at University Press, and I built, built everything really around these small groups. The, they were in the fraternities and sororities and the dorms. I even visited some of them, but they were all run by college kids. Some of them that, that then went on to, to do very serious Bible study, but they did Bible study in their in their dorm, in their fraternity, in their sorority. And it was so great. And then we had, the, we had the common meeting once a week. That was great too. We call that on Tuesday night. That was a common time. But the, and we had retreats. And they, they, were, they played their role. But there were these small groups. I got to Manila and I was sold on this. But I have a very busy expatriate church uh, with people from all over, the, uh, all over the world that are there. And how do I get them? You know what I did? I did a tricky thing. I started a high school group and I got them the only time because the American school started classes at about 7.30 or 8 in the morning because it's tropics. So I got them to come at 6 a.m. And we got, and they, they, they thought that was really tough that these boys and girls came to a Bible study at 6 a.m. Do you know it became a legendary thing in the church? Men would come up to me at cocktail parties and say, what have you got going that my son is there at your church? Because we were just a a few blocks from the American school uh, at 6 a.m. I said, well, we're doing this Bible study. And then I I began to branch out and had him studying Karl Barth's Dogmatics and Outline and then C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. I began to, you can do exposition of it. I'm an expositor of C.S. Lewis too. Helping Lewis to make his own point. Help Karl Barth make his own point. So I love exposition. I do it with books as well as with the Bible. And I got them doing that. And then these fathers would say to me, what what have you got? I said, you know, would you like to be in a group? And I started some men's group with guys that were so busy. And then women's group, too. The women were easier to get going because they were willing to meet at 10 in the morning. And the men, I got some early morning men's groups. Because they saw their kids doing it, said, hey, I want to do And it's funny. I lured them into it. And then they got, they got and it got carried away. Because, uh, but you have to have a strategy. And one strategy is take advantage of what you've got going for you and then uh, build a strategy around it. And I'm not, uh, you know, I'll give you a, a funny line. I'm not against bribing a a, a bribing a person to get exposed to, to the gospel. I'm against bribing for faith. I don't want to bribe somebody to have faith. Then they become a, a, the wrong kind of Christian in a way. But I'm not against bribing them to get exposed. And like, I, I would be in, I'm in favor of bribing a teenager to go to opera, but pick the right opera. And then say, we're going to have a wonderful time going to dinner afterward or we'll go to a game afterward. But I want you to see La Boheme because I know if they see La Boheme, they will be swept off their feet. Or if they saw Les Miserables, they're going to be literally taken. And so I'm in favor of that. A mother once came to me in Seattle and said, I want my son to go to the youth group, but he won't go because he said he doesn't know anybody there. And then she said, I've got an idea. Would you have, and then she mentioned our youth pastor's name, would you might have him call my son, but don't say that I said anything. I said, well, I can't do that. I, I, I refuse to do that because that's deceptive. Well, so then she was sad. So then I said, but I have an idea. Have you ever thought of bribing him to go to the youth group? <laughs> say that you give him $20 if he goes twice to the youth group. And then I will alert the youth pastor that when he shows up, that they'll really be friendly to him because he says he doesn't know anybody. And he, they'll introduce him around so he'll be, make some friends because we had a lot of schools all represented in our high school group. And she brightened immeasurably that, yes, that works. Uh, I'll bribe $20 if you just go to the youth group twice. That's all. And you know, he got hooked. 
because the group turned out, they did have some friends. I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of figuring out clever ways. Uh, like if you go to a, a church and, and you, nobody is interested in Bible study, get the youth to a 6 a.m. meeting and the whole church will know about it because nobody's up at 6 a.m. for a group. And kids will go for that, uh, serve donuts and stuff like that, but they'll go for it. And uh, then the key, though, is to get the text going and trust the text to be relevant to the missional uh, setting like it's relevant to the uh, uh, friend, the uh, uh, friendly church setting. All hey, right. Now, the, he, we have questions from everybody. Here. Yeah, now we want you to be able to ask your questions, and I'm going to ask you to write them down and have them ready and succinct because we only have so much time. Uh, I do think we've, we've learned a secret sauce here today, though, uh, because I was with Earl in Washington, D.C. one time, and he offered to show me his great file system of his sermons. And Eric, where's your notes? Uh, Eric has a yellow, uh, yellow sheet of paper. Uh, this, is, this is Earl's. This is the secret sauce. It's the yellow. I'm sorry, brother. You've got the white paper right here. This is not going to work. No, 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 that's right. So uh, this is the most important thing we may get out of this day is the yellow page, and it also has to be with illegible handwriting uh, because I, I work with Earl regularly and, and I can't read a thing he writes. Um, but um, So now, what questions do you have? And I'm going to start with one real quick. And it goes to uh, Eric's question, which, which was about this, uh, the, the topical uh, expositional. And I'm wondering, Earl, if you think it's inappropriate to merge those two. In other words, what you've done today is taken three texts and you do an expository presentation, and you've tied them together around this wonderful theme of the joy of teaching through exposition. Is that inappropriate? Is that, is that a wrong use of expositional preaching to build a series around texts that do legitimately address the topic that you're speaking on? Oh, by all means, you can, you can go for a topic. And I, being a pastor for a long time, I've had people that have said, we want you to come to speak uh, at this meeting and uh, we would like you to uh, speak on uh, justice or we want, to, uh, want you to speak on uh, the importance of uh, uh, the importance of discipleship training or something that there, that's happening and then but then then find a text that is legitimately in that then you have to make a decision and make sure that the sermon doesn't uh, but it, for instance, could you, take, could you take 52 Sundays in a year and develop a, a, a set of si a series that you will do topically throughout the year, but approach each of them expositionally? It's, it's kind of a, trying to look for what Eric is describing as this, uh, what the audience is becoming accustomed to, what it is they think they need, and what it is that you and many of us believe is, is what they actually can most benefit from. Well, he mentioned like people are interested in family life and how families can. Well, the Bible has so much to say about family and so much advice and counsel that is so healthy and wonderful. And it's it is contextual. You can see it in, in every one of Paul's letters. The first part of his letter is theological and, and usually concludes his prayers for the people. And then the second half of every letter is ethical. So you've got so much ethics. If you take the latter part of Romans, chapter 12 on, it's how can we make it in the Roman world today? Yeah. How can we make it? And he covers every subject, how to relate to strangers, how to relate to within the body of Christ, how yeah. to relate to your family. And I think you can do that. And it can be very valid and it can be expositionally okay. with integrity. And yet it's, it's covering great themes. Okay, let's get going with your questions now and just uh, raise your hands. And we're taping this today, so we need the microphone. Yeah, Harvey Drake uh, with uh, Emerald City Bible Fellowship here in Seattle. A uh, quick question about uh, let the text speak. Uh, when people aren't as involved in searching the text, what's the value or challenge with tell me what it means to you Bible studies? What is the value of what? Tell me what it means to you Bible studies. Because we have people sit around in a circle and they say, well, what does the text mean to you? I, yes, I think that is a very important question in every small Bible study group. Uh, you know, but I go at it several ways. 
start with just the questions of the, of the quest. Is there something here that, that, is, that bothers? Is there something here that stirs you up? I, rather than to say, what does it mean to you? I kind of save that to last. What stirs you up here? Is there anything that intrigues you here? Do you, what do you, where do you think Paul's going? Those kinds of questions that are mild, in my opinion, but they are open the door in a wonderful way for a small group. And you'll be amazed how sometimes the people with the least initiation into, quote, theological language will come up with the most intriguing insights. Okay. Yeah. Next but I question. think I'd go that way. Earl, I've asked you this many times in private, but I thought I'd give you a chance to say it in public. Or To what extent must one come to terms with the challenges of critical analysis of the scriptures in order to be an expository preacher? Yeah. Do you have to be a, um, a inerrantist, a literist, or can, or can you even be sympathetic to some of the explanations of Bishop Spong? Well, uh, you know, that is a huge question, and I, but I've, I do have very definite opinions there. I do believe that uh, the help that Lewis and Dorothy Sayers gave me uh, in what they wrote about Scripture was very good. Lewis was at core, a, uh, was interested in what we call literary criticism. What does the text say in its own setting? And, and that is what exposition is f focused on. What does the text say in its own setting? And then you have to make some decisions. And the, remember when I talked about the historical question in the text and behind the text. The t one of the historical questions behind the text is when was this text written? Uh, I didn't just particularly feature that with you today, but when was it written? And some of the challenges, the, the technical challenges to text have come over when it was written. And I think that's where you need, you as a, a teacher need to do your work to, so that you're satisfied on what, when it was written. And, uh, and then, of course, you're going to ask, ask these historical goals. Well, what's the goal of this text? What's it, what's it after? But when was it written? Who wrote it? What is, and I think once you settle, the main technical questions are when it was written. And thankfully for us, the huge weight, the contemporary weight of scholarship has shoved the dates of the New Testament letters earlier and earlier and earlier. If, when Schleiermacher wrote what he wrote at the beginning of the 19th century, many people thought that te the texts of the New Testament were written in the 300s and 350 and 400. Uh, but that was before manuscript research and manuscript archaeology was even a, a thought of. And that's why Albert Schweitzer's book is not helpful, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, because he felt that these Gospel of John accounts were written in 300. That changes everything. That isn't Jesus speaking. It's a community of people in 300 imagining what Jesus would say. Well, that, you preach that in a far different way. What, and I'm going to handle Jesus in John 15. He said it, and John has recorded it for us, I, because we now know that these texts the dates get earlier and earlier and earlier. I, as I told you, I wrote a commentary in Revelation. And even the most conservative scholars of Revelation always felt that the, the persecution being mainly addressed there was the Domitian persecution, 95 AD. That makes John as a very, very old man when he writes the book of Revelation. I don't agree with that. And nor does William Foxwell Albright, the greatest archaeologist of our time. He wrote a very important monograph that he says, I see no reason for dating any book, this is Albright, any book in the New Testament after 70 AD. Because the destruction of Jerusalem was such a huge event. Josephus wrote a whole book on it. To have it not even mentioned by John in the book of Revelation, it's obvious that it's Nero that Revelation is referring to. That puts it before 70 AD not 95, then you interpret it differently. Now, those decisions, you do have to do research on yourself and become satisfied, and that's why you have to read uh, what scholars have written. And unfortunately, a lot of foolish stuff was written until the kind of uh, scholarly work has shoved the dates earlier. Now, that doesn't handle all the questions of a guy like Spong or, a, or, or like the Jesus Seminar that decided to vote on what John passages were valid and what weren't, so that they would give you an approved list, and they voted on that. I don't want to go with that. I believe that the texts, as they stand in canon, need to be uh, uh, taught 
as, as part of canon. That means the ch early church decided these texts were valid. And they're valid. Uh, that means I, I treat John as the author of the book of John. I don't have a Johann community in the second century, which now hardly any scholar can hold because it's ironic. But the oldest manuscripts we've found go be uh, it's P, like P46 is before the first century. It's the end of the first century. It's not in the 300s. And the church fathers, of course, do all the quoting. And they write in the 200s. So it, no, the dates move back. And that, in a way, is where I would go with the, with the technical questions. Earl, you know, Aristotle said to be persuasive, you have to have logic and, uh, and you have to have integrity and passion. Could you work on the passion a little bit? <laughs> uh, not sure it's really coming through. Uh, any other questions? And by the way, do either of you gentlemen have any comments on either of these questions? The kind of Bible study, well, what do you think about the text? What do you think about the text? And so forth, or this most recent question. I, one thing I'd like to say, uh, back to the words we've been using, trick or bribe, uh, I think just a, maybe the word we should think about is like an appetizer or enhancing. Because I don't, I, once you read the Bible, you don't have to trick anybody. I mean, the Bible speaks for itself as you've been th teaching. And I think I, our challenge in this culture is because we do want everything topical. And we do want everything thematic and quick. When it comes to the Bible, as you have said, I don't feel so much comfortable tricking somebody into it. But I, I so believe that it speaks for itself that if you preach it, no matter what age group or what culture, they're going to respond to it. I don't think we have to trick anybody. Yeah. All right. Eric, you got any comments? I, I guess I'll... I'll bring it up again. I don't know if anyone else is interested in this, but it, but it seems like it's going two directions. We're getting a smaller church, house church, and we're getting larger multi-site. Um, what do you th what do you think about uh, someone gathering for worship and seeing a screen? Good exposition, but it's mediated through a screen. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I I don't have strong opinions except uh, I really feel that in the church setting itself, I don't want to go through. Uh, electronic uh, screen. Uh, so I don't. I never use PowerPoint, and I I, I use the, the whiteboard. It bothers some people, but I, I'd rather do that, even though no one can read what I write. But it, it, I I would rather do that than have it go through the media uh, when I'm in that living center. But people who are watching in, this is being filmed for us today because we we wanted a we wanted a video this outstanding videography crew to capture this and capture your questions and capture everything in a live setting. And I think that does have great validity. Yes, and I, I think we have to be realistic about that too, that in a large setting, it does make things possible. All right, we've got another question over here. Earl, point number four, where you talked about how the words were heard by the listeners or the readers. Paul was just a superior communicator and would use the words that the people uh, to whom he was addressing themselves used and was able to evoke um, a feeling of, there was emotional as well as intellectual communication. I was wondering um, if Paul were to write to uh, the church in Seattle, would he use the words beast or beast mode to which contemporary critics might, talk, might think it, uh, without knowing the context, think it were turkey and turkey with ice cream. Um, you used the words treco, run and be honored. For example, did Thessalonica have an Olympic athletic tradition uh, in which they heard those words which gave them a special significance? Wow, the word run uh, that he says to the Thessalonians. Well, it is interesting, isn't it, that Thessalonica is in, is in Macedonia. And it is exactly where the Olympics were held, it would be just a few miles south. And they would be, they would be certainly aware of running. And I think it is wonderful that he uses the word run. And, uh, and he does use uh, uh, slang expressions. In Philippians, he talks about, uh, uh, he uses a garbage word for uh, my righteousness was like garbage. And, the, and so the RSV translates it off, it translates it uh, uh, refuse. But it's a very crude word that he uses and he decides to throw that into Philippians. It's, it's, a, it's only used there, nowhere else in the New Testament. It means off-scouring 
or you know, waste. And it's interesting, Tolkien picks that up with Gandalf when he comes to uh, King Theoden. Wormtongue says, what has this uh, storm picker, what has this storm picker come to tell? It, which is, again, a crude word that Tolkien picks up because he knows that Paul used it. So again, that's using a crude word, but he doesn't do it very often. He, uses, he usually uses just ordinary words, but certainly run would bring to their mind. I, I love that. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Um, Earl, just uh, getting to the question of what did it mean to those people then, uh, are we running into a, a problem in contemporary society where I just get a sense that um, a number of people maybe in an audience think, I don't care what those people thought. They're, they weren't human. And I know that they, they were ancient, the, their, their world is not being taught you know, uh, how they felt, what they thought um, seems to be arrogantly dismissed as though we progressed beyond that. Can you address how you re-energize their world? Uh, well, yeah. Th th you know, that is a very interesting question. It's the large question that uh, David McCullough is going at when he talks about when you lose the sense of history, then you, you lose uh, the ability then to really communicate at a deeper level, even now. That, that loss of history. So in a way, don't give in to that. Uh, they, when you can show that Paul, in, in uh, writing to the Galatians, knows that the Galatians have been infected with a kind of legalism that has now swept in, that unless this Greek man is circumcised like, uh, like the, the uh, little Jewish boy on the eighth day of his life, then he can't really be, a, he has, can't really fulfill the righteousness of God. So when Paul, now you might say that circumcision issue, it's not an issue today. Well, be careful. There are so many similarities of, of demands that a religious group will make or a, a, a one Christian will make of another Christian that if, if you're really going to be a Christian, you have to do this. So in a way, with a little help, you can take the Galatian text and Paul can make it very contemporary to us. Though its, it's specific issue was settled in the Council of Jerusalem, but not really finally because people are still struggling with legalism but now, isn't it interesting that Paul picks that up in 2 Corinthians in the text I read? He said, if there's a glory in judgment and of uh, uh, you know, the old judgments, but there's a greater glory in justification. There's a greater glory in grace. So that that's why Paul will use this. In, he'll say, if you're going to eat meat, remember there was a big problem, should you eat meat offered to idols? And Jews would say, absolutely not, because you shouldn't eat meat anyway, uh, unless it's kosher. So... Uh, but Paul will say, no, uh, uh, he finally says it this way in Romans. He says, no, to the meat eaters, me eat meat to the glory of God. To the vegetarians, eat vegetables to the glory of God. And now don't bother each other. See, he puts it to a higher level. But those, the, we're not in maybe struggling with that issue today. But the way he does it is universally that's why I said that contemporary question bridges. What would be bothersome in the first century, but then what would be bothersome now? And, and watch how Paul kind of navigates that. But Rick or Eric, anything you guys want to add on either of those last questions? Yeah, be sure these, these questions are to you guys too. Okay, Marty. So my question is, we're focusing on the text, but to what degree do we allow the voice of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, you know, let the church hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches and the sheep learning to hear the shepherd's voice. So to what degree do we hear the original biblical authors and to what degree in our preaching are we really acclimatizing our people to learn to hear the voice of God, Father, Son, Spirit? Yeah, the, uh, well, I, I think what you're getting at is that the, the, the a serious attention to, the, the, uh, to Bible study is uh, putting you in a frame of mind where you want to hear God's uh, word. And, but in the, in the large sense, too, you want to hear the Holy Spirit comfort you and assure you. And that's a huge thing in Paul. I think, for instance, Paul handles all spiritual gifts this way. He handles the whole ministry of the Holy Spirit this way. The whole of it, is, it comes to this. 
uh, here's how Calvin put it. The Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ binds us to himself. So that when you, in Bible study, get uh, attached to Jesus Christ, and, you, and he wins your respect, and you put your faith in him, you don't have to worry about anything else. The, it's the Holy Spirit who's giving you that confidence to put your weight down on Jesus Christ. And he assures you. And he'll assure each of us in all kinds of different ways. And I think a, a faithful Bible study gets you ready for that. And then also makes you less judgmental of others who are having a different way of assurance than what you experience. And there's where Paul is a great help. The key is, are you assured? Are you assured of Jesus Christ? See, has the word sped on and won your respect? And if that's happened, don't ask for anything more. <laughs> and be, be grateful. He has done it. And that's what I think Bible study has that kind of clarifying effect. All right. Either of you have any final comments before These we are take pastors. our break? I'm going to address that. Um, so I, I, I've, I've thought a little bit about the, how the Word of God functions in the preaching of the Word and sort of a Trinitarian understanding of that. Now, one thing I'll say maybe by way of dismissal is I, I'm wary of those that will say, I, did, I didn't prepare this week. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit help me <laughs> you know, speak to the congregation. I think that's a cop-out in a sense because God speaks primarily through his Word but that said, I, so I believe in, and you've taught me well, I get my sermon done by Thursday at noon, so I'm not cutting corners, and then I let it percolate. I need to come back to it Saturday night, or it's cold, you know, by Sunday morning. So I come back, I take the whole day off, come back to it uh, Saturday night, look at it, go through it again. I found one of the great th discoveries for me as a preacher is it's really fun to preach for a living congregation, because you go to these texts on behalf of these people, uh, you don't go just with your own questions. You come with their questions. As you, that's why I don't like the simulcast. I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a severance between the, 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 the preacher and the congregation. That said, once all that preparation is done and the preaching moment comes, and I do think it is an event that happens that's unique when we worship and, 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 we, and we preach the word, sometimes what I preach is slightly different from what my manuscript said. And sometimes uh, in that I see these, these eyes and I see they didn't get that and I try to rephrase it or I come up with an analogy on the spot. And uh, sometimes I, I, some, I forget something or I leave something out that was supposed to be there. And sometimes I will, I don't know if I can justify this theologically, I'll call that the editorial, the editing of the Holy Spirit. I was not meant to say that this morning. I thought Saturday night this was gonna happen and Sunday, it, so I don't use that as an excuse. But I do try to be attentive to the way God is actively leading in that preaching moment. And it's a very, I think, a very sacred time. And I, I feel one of the great joys of being a preacher is I, I, it's more exciting to preach a text on behalf of a whole community, more than just individual Bible study for me. And I sense that when I hear you preach, too, I'll tell you. Some final thoughts, Earl. Um, sorry to differ on this point. I do use the PowerPoint on Sundays, but my sermon is done on Tuesday, not hey, Thursday. Tuesday, oh wow. On white paper. <laughs> on white paper, hey, that's all right. Um, and I've come to find, uh, using still the expositional approach, you can do it in an effective way on a PowerPoint if you, do, if you make your emphasis on what, your, what the Bible says by what, what it means. Yes. And so it has worked for me, and I'm sure many others that don't want to tell you that they use PowerPoint, but uh, there's a way to make it work, especially with the culture now, because there, I had to acclimate to this, because I'm this kind of way, the handwritten way, but uh, my people want more to be able to write it down and see it, and in our church, they even take pictures with their smartphones of the slides, so it's just something... I do. <laughs> I, all right. Now, I want to I wanna be really f faithful now. Uh, one of the reasons I don't use PowerPoint is I, I'm not good at it. And uh, <laughs> my, my son-in-law, Eric, uses PowerPoint, and I've watched, he even has pictures. And now, I, I would probably like yours. So in a way, I, w I st still don't like it to be mediated between the, with the equipment. But, you know, it's partly that I can't do it. So uh, that may be a fundamental reason. Well, it's been a wonderful m morning. We're all going to be praying for Earl's problem with pride yeah. uh, in PowerPoint. And we're all going to work on learning how to bribe our congregations. 
Uh, we've learned so much already this morning. Uh, but we're going to take a break now. We had a lot of food for thought. There is some food over here. If you arrive late, you do have a table number, and there's plenty of materials and spaces at the tables. So let's take a break. We'll be back here at about 1045 and get started with more.